Spider-Man. He's amazing, he's sensational, he's spectacular. Just a few of the adjectives used to describe the character over the years. First appearing in the 1962 Marvel comic book Amazing Fantasy issue 15 and created by the legendary pair of writer Stan Lee and artist Steve Ditko, Spider-Man was an instant hit. So popular with comic book readers of the time that when the Amazing Fantasy series was eventually cancelled, Spider-Man took over with his own books, The Amazing Spider-Man. Alter ego Peter Parker, a New York City school student and later part-time freelance photographer for the Daily Bugle newspaper, is one day bitten by a radioactive spider that gifts him superpowers. But he was no Superman with flight and invulnerability. No Spider-Man was completely different for the time, as he had the strength of a spider, he could sense danger in his surroundings, and he was a scientific genius, creating his own super-strong tensile web shooters, which he used instead of more deadlier firearms. It also allowed him to get around the New York urban jungle, and also works as an incredibly impressive video game traversal mechanic. Spider-Man made his video game debut in 1982 when he swung onto the Atari 2600 in the very first Marvel video game. Developed by American toy manufacturer Parker Brothers, Spider-Man on the Atari is a very simple game that tasks you to climb and reach the top of the Empire State Building in New York and defuse a bomb set by the dastardly supervillain known as the Green Goblin. Your only way to climb the skyscraper is to use Spider-Man's web line to either climb vertically or to swing diagonally. There are obstacles preventing you from reaching the top such as enemies that appear from windows, smaller bombs and Green Goblin himself higher up. These obstacles can cut your web line causing you to fall but you'll get a few seconds to shoot another web if you are quick enough. Reaching the top awards you points and takes you to the next level in which you have to do it all over again, however the tower gets taller, enemies move quicker, the colour of the stage will change and Goblin appears more times up the tower. Spider-Man saw mixed to positive reception upon its release, with Mark Trost, who reviewed the game in early 1983, saying that the game was challenging, graphically acceptable and ultimately engrossing also giving praise to Spider-Man's web shooting and swinging abilities in the game. Despite the character's success, however, this would be his first and last console game that he would receive in the 80s. However, by the 1990s, Spider-Man and Marvel Comics hit a new boom, especially with video games. The next console Spider-Man game would be released in 1990 for the Game Boy, developed by popular company Rare. The Amazing Spider-Man was a side-scrolling action game and the first of many Marvel games published by Acclaim in the early 90s. In this next game, Spider-Man's wife, Mary Jane, has been kidnapped by many of the wall crawler's most popular foes, who have discovered his true identity. You must now battle through six levels. Spider-Man can punch and crouch to perform a kick, he can fire webs and double jump which leads into a web swing across the top of the level. And there's the web meter that limits your use of his web based moves, although this can be replenished by finding web vials. There are a myriad of different obstacles in each level, like bats in the sewers, lizards that try to grab you from underneath manhole covers, and some levels will have you crawling up a building, avoiding enemies popping out the windows, very similar to Atari Spider-Man. You also have a spider sense that lets you know that something is going to fall above you, this being the first video game appearance of the spider sense. Each level starts with a short cutscene that introduces which villain that you'll be facing. The dialogue with Spider-Man talking to his foe over a walkie-talkie does well in capturing the essence of Spidey with the way that he calls each of his foes different names like Pumpkin Brain and Tail Twirler. The first level has you battle one of Spider-Man's most popular villains, the Master of Illusion, Mysterio. Once a special effects artist, Quinton Beck, now dons his crime-fighting alter ego Mysterio, utilising his skills with holograms and movie technology. The second level introduces the Hobgoblin, a more demonic looking heir to the Goblin villain. The third level is in New York Subway as you battle Scorpion, 
the foe who was once known as Mac Gargan. He underwent an experiment funded by Daily Bugle editor J. Jonah Jameson in an effort to rid the world of Spider-Man once and for all. While the suit gave Gargan the attributes and strength of a scorpion, the side effects far outweighed the advantages and he quickly saw the loss of his sanity and he became trapped in the armoured suit. The fourth level in Central Park has you battle Rhino, a small time crook turned human bulldozer. After undergoing chemical and radiation treatments to create a super assassin, he was fitted into a durable suit of armour and the Rhino was born. The penultimate level has you battle one of Spider-Man's most iconic villains of all time, Doctor Octopus. Always trying to create the next leap in human evolution, Dr. Otto Octavius created four arms to assist him in his laboratory, but after becoming bonded to him in an accident, it resulted in the birth of his alter ego, Dr. Octopus. The final level, set in the sewer, sees Spidey battle the true perpetrator, Venom, aka Eddie Brock, once the journalistic rival of Peter Parker, he blames Spidey for ruining his life. With the symbiote Venom, they become one of Spider-Man's deadliest rivals. Once Venom is defeated, Spider-Man rescues Mary Jane, and the game is completed. Acclaim followed The Amazing Spider-Man up with two sequels also exclusive to the Game Boy. In 1992, there was The Amazing Spider-Man 2 featuring Carnage slap bang on the cover art of the game. This sequel was now developed by Bits Studios, taking over from Rare. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is more of an adventure game with some light action elements. Spider-Man still features his movesets from the previous game, with him now being able to hang onto his webline. But there's also the new task of having to find and collect different objects like keys, located in each level in order to solve the puzzles and progress further. Another group of foes have framed the webhead in robbing a bank. In order to clear his name, he sets out to track down who has framed him. It features comic book styled cutscenes and cameos from other Marvel superheroes, such as Black Cat and the Human Torch, Johnny Storm. The foes that Spidey is up against in this adventure are Hobgoblin for the second time, Lizard, who was once renowned scientist Dr. Kirk Connors, but after trying desperately to regrow his missing arm back, utilising Lizard DNA, he has mutated into a vicious reptilian monster. There's Graviton, once physicist Franklin Hall. He discovered Gravitonium, which bonded with his own molecular structure, gifting him gravity-defying powers. The sub-boss is Carnage, a red symbiote murderer. Once he is dealt with, Spidey confronts the imposter, who was none other than the menacing Mysterio. Spider-Man battles him aboard a blimp, flying over New York City. After Mysterio is defeated, Spider-Man's reputation is restored. The third and final Spider-Man game on the Game Boy was Spider-Man 3 Invasion of the Spider Slayers, once again developed by Bits Studios. It follows on from the previous two games with Spider-Man retaining his web swinging and action moves, but this time each level contains an objective that must be completed before the time runs out. However, it is still basic in practice. Invasion of the Spider Slayers is loosely based on the Marvel Comics storyline of the same name. Spider-Man is enjoying his day of catching crooks, when he is attacked by a Spider Slayer, which looks awfully like a Xenomorph. Spidey has to defend against the Spider Slayer robots and discover who is trying to kill him. He also has to help the police apprehend certain criminals, Scorpion and Electro, aka Max Dillon. Once a technician, when working on a power line during a thunderstorm, he was struck by lightning which left him with newfound powers that he used to turn to a life of crime. Electro is defeated and Spider-Man continues his investigation into the Spider Slayers. It turns out that the robots were created by Dr. Alistair Smythe out of revenge against Spider-Man for imprisoning him in an asylum and the final battle is against this mutated form of Alistair Smythe. The trilogy of Game Boy Spider-Man games garnered mixed reception for being quite cheap and challenging Spidey adventures. However, they provided gamers at the time the first steps for interactive, handheld Spider-Man stories. 
Next, let's rewind back to 1991, when Spider-Man saw his first leap onto the Sega consoles with Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin. It released for four of Sega's platforms, the Genesis, the Master System, the Game Gear and the Sega CD. The Genesis version was developed by a company known as Technopop, and sees you controlling Spider-Man through colourful, side-scrolling platformer-type levels, collecting a set of keys in order to progress to the final level. Spider-Man is able to web-swing, fire his webs at his enemies, and create a web shield. The web meter returns with limited cartridges, but a new mechanic in Spider-Man vs the Kingpin is the camera, to which you can snap photographs of the enemies in each level, which Peter then uses to sell at the bugle, and get cash for them, which you can then use to replenish your web meter between levels. It's a creative way of incorporating other aspects of Spider-Man into the gameplay. There are also some more standout features of this game, such as Spider-Man utilising his spider sense when enemies spawn, or being able to travel back to Peter's home to replenish your health. These features and attention to detail made it one of the most standout Spider-Man games for a very long time. In Spider-Man vs the Kingpin, the titular supervillain, philanthropist Wilson Fisk, goes on live television reporting to the citizens of New York that Spider-Man has planted a bomb somewhere in the city, and he issues a $10,000 reward for the capturing of Spider-Man. Peter sees the headlines and goes on a mission to clear his name and disarm the bomb that the Kingpin has set. The whole game is against the clock, with the timer ticking down in the corner of the screen, and when you travel back to Peter's home to heal your health, it ticks down twice as fast, so you're always being challenged. As Spider-Man works through the game's areas, Kingpin has hired multiple foes to take the webhead down. First Spider-Man battles Dr. Octopus, and then he battles the Lizard in New York sewer. At the power plant, Spidey faces off against Electro, and in Central Park he battles Sandman, once escaped convict William Baker, or later known as Flint Marco, when he escaped prison and went on the run, he hid from the police in an atomic testing site that ended up merging his DNA with the grains of the sand in the area. Now he continues his life of crime as Sandman. Spidey defeats Sandman by dosing him with water. Later, the Kingpin uses Venom to kidnap Mary Jane. Spider-Man battles both Hobgoblin and then Venom before proceeding onto the Kingpin's lair. Inside, Spidey uses the keys that he has collected from each villain to defuse the bomb, and then goes on to battle the Kingpin and save Mary Jane once again. There is an alternate ending if you don't manage to defuse the bomb or rescue Mary Jane in time, which results in New York being destroyed in an explosion. However, we'll say that... <laughs> The canonical ending is Spider-Man defeating the Kingpin of Crime and having a happy ending with MJ. The Master System and Game Gear versions are mostly the same as on the Genesis. Along with minor graphical differences, redesigned stages and more primitive animations, there are also extra cutscenes that fit fellow Marvel superhero Doctor Strange into the mix, who assists Spider-Man in locating the villains. The Sega CD version released in 1993 and was retitled to The Amazing Spider-Man vs The Kingpin. This one featured the same levels and features as the Genesis version, just now with extra content. First, there were new fully animated cutscenes, complete with voice acting, replacing the text boxes of the previous versions and also expanding the story of the game, such as Lizard now turning back into Dr. Connors when he's defeated, scared and afraid of what he has done. It also featured sharper graphics, with some sprites being redesigned, faster gameplay, and with some new combat moves, and also came with new UI. There are three new levels, a subway stage with Vulture as the boss, a funhouse stage that starts with Spidey in a giant pinball machine, this stage ends with the battle against Mysterio, and an extra level when Venom is introduced, which is the first of many battles against Venom that takes place inside a cathedral with using the bells to defeat him due to his sensitivity to sound. In the final battle against the Kingpin, he was given two bodyguards in the form of Bullseye and Typhoid Mary, who act as the new sub-bosses to this version. With all these upgrades and extras, the Sega CD version feels almost like a remaster of the original. 
Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin was the first major success that the character had in the video game industry, with it being reported at the time that two-thirds of all Sega Genesis owners had a copy of this game. It was incredibly popular, and for good reason, with its amazing graphics and spectacular gameplay for its time. Spider-Man was back in 1992, with Acclaim returning with another adventure that released for the older platforms of the time, the NES, and then a year later for the Sega Master System and the Game Gear. Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six was the third Spider-Man game developed by Bits Studios, and was another side-scrolling action game that saw Spider-Man battle his classic team of supervillains. Return of the Sinister Six is a much simpler game compared to the previous game from Sega. Spidey can combat his opponents, he can web swing, and he can fire web projectiles. Return of the Sinister Six sees Spider-Man's arch nemesis, Dr. Octopus, rally five of the webhead's deadliest foes to reform the classic team. Spider-Man then battles each villain one by one at the end of each level. The foes in question are Electro, Sandman, Mysterio, Vulture, Hobgoblin, and lastly, the master planner himself, Doc Ock. The sensational Spider-Man defeats them all, once again bringing an end to Ock's plans. Return of the Sinister Six was another miss by Acclaim, seeing heavy criticism when it released for having sloppy controls and tough gameplay that felt quite unfair at times. Due to the game's challenge, when the Master System and Game Gear versions released in 1993, some enemy placements and stages were redesigned to make the game more accessible, but it was a bit too little, too late, and the game's reputation has stuck with it ever since. When Spider-Man came back in 1994, it released with a bang. One of the biggest launches in the Webhead's video game career at the time was Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage, that launched on the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. It was developed by Software Creations and still published by Acclaim. Maximum Carnage had an epic front cover and even came with a red game cartridge, which makes it quite a sought-after collector's item today. This time around, the latest Spidey adventure was a beat-em-up game that played in a similar fashion to Sega's Streets of Rage and other numerous popular beat-em-ups of the time. Multiple enemies pour onto the screen, and you use Spider-Man's punches, uppercuts and throw attacks to clear the levels, even being able to use his webs to grab enemies from afar. There are also sections where you have to climb buildings, dodging various obstacles. Throughout the game you'll find these character icons, that when picked up give you an ally assist move, essentially a screen clearing attack from other Marvel Universe characters that help Spider-Man in his battle with Carnage. And there's a lot of great cameos here from Marvel's more popular heroes like Captain America and Black Cat, to lesser known street level characters like Cloak and Dagger, Iron Fist, Firestar, Deathlock and the living vampire Morbius. For the very first time, you also have the option of playing as Venom. Venom controls much like Spider-Man does, with him still able to punch, throw, web swing and web grab, however he has different animations making him more like a powerful, brute character. That being said though, there is surprisingly no multiplayer in this game, despite having two playable characters. In Maximum Carnage, Cletus Cassidy is a new inmate at Ravencroft Asylum. However, before he can reach his cell, he breaks free by unleashing the symbiote and transforms into Carnage. At the asylum, he meets Shriek, who is fantasised by the mayhem that he has caused. They decide to team up to cause even more chaos. Whilst free and on a murder spree in New York, they recruit more deadly foes to their ranks. A six-armed, mindless and vicious Spider-Man looking creature called Doppelganger, a demon from Limbo known as Demo Goblin, and a villain who has the ability to disintegrate organic matter just through touch, known as Carrion. Venom, who has a deep hatred for Carnage, tries to battle him but he is no match, thus he has but one choice to make, to ally with his rival Spider-Man. Spider-Man and Venom also recruit many other heroes to assist them, and they even break into the Fantastic Four headquarters to retrieve the Sonic Gun, which can help defeat Carnage. 
when Firestar stops herself from killing Carnage by dosing him in flames, Venom is enraged and this breaks the team up. However, fellow Avenger Captain America arrives to offer Spider-Man a hand in the conflict. Carnage is the final boss and he is battled at St. Estes Orphanage where Cletus Cassidy grew up. Carnage is finally defeated by Spider-Man and Venom and the Avengers arrive to take Carnage away for good. Maximum Carnage is one of the most dividing reputations out of many Spider-Man games. Upon its release, it was another licensed superhero game with middling reviews, many commenting on the game's sloppy graphics and mediocre control. Magazine GamePro had the most to say about the game, citing that the game is overly long and repetitive due to the player character's limited selection of moves, the lack of objects to interact with, the low variety of enemies, and the similar look to all of the backgrounds. However, in recent years, Maximum Carnage has seen a far different reception, gaining a cult following for its enjoyable soundtrack, fun comic book story, multiple playable characters, and has even been labelled by IGN, Complex, and CBR.com to be one of the best beat-em-ups from its time. Acclaim came back in 1995 with not just one, but two more Spider-Man games. The first was a follow-up to Maximum Carnage, Spider-Man and Venom Separation Anxiety, another action beat-em-up for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, and developed again by Software Creations. Separation Anxiety plays almost identical to Maximum Carnage, however it feels more rushed and not nearly on the same budget with controls that are sluggish, graphics aren't quite as stylized as they were in Maximum Carnage, and the creative comic book styled cutscenes are replaced with simple scrolling text. However, the biggest addition in this sequel was finally the introduction of two player, allowing you and another player to take control of Spider-Man and Venom together. Ally assists make a return, the screen clearing special pickups, however there are significantly less characters now, only featuring assists from Captain America, Hawkeye, Daredevil and Ghost Rider. In Separation Anxiety, a company known as the Life Foundation has kidnapped Eddie Brock and extracted five symbiote spawns from Venom, with plans to attach them to their soldiers, in turn creating an unstoppable army. Before the spawns could kill their host, Venom manages to escape. He forms a new alliance with his old foe, Spider-Man, in order to stop these new symbiotes from becoming as big a threat as Venom's last spawn, Carnage. You battle through the underground city and headquarters of the Life Foundation, taking down their armies of soldiers and scientists, and occasionally battling the bosses of the game in the form of the new symbiote spawns. There's the Grey Riot, Yellow Symbiote Scream, Orange Fague, Green Symbiote Lasher, and Pink Symbiote Agony. When you reach the end and defeat the Symbiote spawns, you have a final battle with the original Carnage, who had been held captive all along by the Life Foundation. Spidey and Venom defeat Carnage once and for all, bringing an end to this Symbiote uprising. Or did they? Separation Anxiety went on to fare worse than Maximum Carnage. The sequel's cheapness was evident from the start up, with no improvement to the graphical style or combat repetition. In Electronic Gaming Monthly's coverage of the game, the only good feature of the game that they could find was the ability to again play as either Spider-Man or Venom. They scored the game a low 4 out of 10, whilst Next Generation Magazine rated the game 2 out of 5 stars. The second acclaimed Spider-Man game in 95 was simply named Spider-Man and was based solely on the animated series that was popular on Saturday morning television. This game went back to the old style of side-scrolling platforming action and was handled by another studio who went by the name of Western Technologies. Spider-Man has all of his moves that you come to expect now, such as melee attacks, web swinging and wall crawling, and they introduced the Spider Armor pickup that gives you some additional health. The plot was very simple, having many of Spidey's villains break out of Ravencroft Asylum and you must go and round them up. It allowed the developers to fit as many Spider-Man foes as they could within the levels, with these six stages having multiple bosses. 
In level 1, Spider-Man battles Dr. Octopus, but then you can also go underground into the sewers and face Lizard and Hydro-Man. Level 2 has you battle Smythe Spider-Slayers. In level 4, you fight Rhino, Jack-O-Lantern, Mysterio, and the Green Goblin, who hasn't made an appearance since the Atari. In level 5, you battle the Beetle, Chameleon, and Alistair Smythe. And the final level has you battle the Owl, Scorpion, and at the end, you have a showdown against Venom. The large rogues gallery really makes the game feel like a celebratory all-star Spider-Man adventure. Nevertheless, Spider-Man 95 still received another dose of incredibly poor reception and low sales. Next Generation Magazine gave the game 2 out of 5 stars, concluding that it was a by-the-numbers affair with weak combat and lack of originality. Electronic Gaming Monthly wrote that the game featured poor sound and a lack of interesting player characters' abilities, giving the game a final score of 4 out of 10. The most positive review I could find was from GamePro, that enjoyed the game's graphics and amount of Marvel character appearances, but still agreed that the controls and sound design were of a low quality. Spider-Man 95 will be the final Spider-Man game from Acclaim after publishing 7 titles. The final Spider-Man game of the 90s that saw a release in the West would be the second Spidey game from Sega, The Amazing Spider-Man Web of Fire, which released in 1996 exclusively for the Sega 32X. Web of Fire is another side-scrolling action game that sees Spider-Man have to defend New York City against the big threat, Hydra who, in an effort to take over control of the city, have caused a giant electrical grid to engulf the skies, trapping everyone inside. Spider-Man can punch, kick, wall crawl, and use his webs to shoot enemies and swing across the levels. In the first stage, you rescue fellow New York superhero Daredevil, who can then be called in to assist Spider-Man when you collect his tokens. The graphics for the game used motion capture animation and were rendered in the Silicon Graphics computer software, enhancing this game's look from the previous Spider-Man entries. Hydra has unleashed some of Marvel's more obscure villains which act as the game's bosses, and the final boss is against the Super Adaptoid. In the end, Spidey destroys the generator supporting the laser grid and destroys Super Adaptoid, racing to the exit of the Hydra airship before it explodes. New York City is saved once again. Unfortunately, Web of Fire is kind of a forgotten entry in the video game industry, due to it being the last released Sega 32X game, launching after Sega had already stopped supporting the system. It released only a limited selection of copies, and as such is a very expensive collector's item today. Because of its stricter availability, not a lot of outlets even bothered to cover the game upon release, but the few that did, didn't have a lot of positive things to say about it, blasting the game's lack of innovation. Marvel in the mid to late 90s was quickly headed for bankruptcy, and during this time, Spider-Man took a well-needed break from the video game scene. When Marvel decided to outsourcing its properties to different movie studios, they had successful video game company Activision, well known for their hit Atari game Pitfall, take over exclusive licensing for future Spider-Man video games. Activision revived the Spider-Man brand in 2000, launching the first ever 3D Spider-Man adventure that were released for the PlayStation, Nintendo 64, Game Boy Color, and a year later on the Dreamcast and PC. Spider-Man 2000 was developed by Neversoft, the same development team that was also working on Activision's Tony Hawk series that features some easter eggs with Spider-Man, such as the webhead himself being playable in Pro Skater 2. Spider-Man is now playable in full 3D, allowing you to wall crawl on almost any surface you can see. You can web swing to a new surface if within range, your webs attach to the top of the level, and you can only travel two swings distance. However, it still looks and feels amazing for its time, and certainly does the job. This is still a linear game with you only ever heading in a single direction, however the first stage which has you travelling across the rooftops of a 3D rendered New York City is a great playground for trying out Spidey's abilities. 
Neversoft really tried to complement all of Spider-Man's superpowers, having his spider sense trigger when enemies are nearby, that makes the whole screen flash, his attacks now featured a donkey kick attack, and Spidey could also use his webs in creative ways, he can shoot his web projectiles, he can web zip to reach certain locations quicker, he can fashion web gloves that give him increased attack power, and even create a web dome that defeats any enemies in his immediate surroundings. His web attacks once more deplete a limited web meter, Spider-Man can carry up to 10 web cartridges, and you can collect more throughout your adventure when your webs are depleted. The spider armour from the 95 Spider-Man game also makes its reappearance, giving Spider-Man a second health bar when picked up. The game is heavily inspired by the animated series, but looks to still takes place in its own continuity, where Peter has been Spider-Man for quite some time. It begins with a reformed Dr. Otto Octavius giving a lecture at a science expo, where he presents his new latest device, and Peter Parker, voiced by Reno Romano, attends to see what his old foe could be up to. Eddie Brock is also in the audience taking pictures of the event, that he hopes will get him his job back at the Daily Bugle. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Octavius' security are being silenced. The enemy reveals itself to be... Spider-Man? The imposter steals Octavius' device and smashes Eddie's camera when he sees him taking pictures. The crowd rush to the exit, giving Peter no opportunity to become the real Spider-Man. Once everyone has left, Eddie Brock hears Jameson's voice telling him he's ruined. This outburst causes the Venom symbiote to resurface, and he vows revenge on Spider-Man. Elsewhere, Octavius, no longer hiding his evil persona as Dr. Octopus, is seen working with Carnage. They start up the device that the imposter supposedly stole, and it spreads gas throughout the city of New York, which prevents you from reaching the ground within the game. It's nice that the developers chose to limit level rendering to only rooftops and indoor stages, making it actually a part of the game's narrative. The game has six chapters, in which Spider-Man will have to investigate the cause of the city's gas leak and clear his name from the heist. The first stage sees Spidey stop a bank heist from a high-tech criminal group known as the Jade Syndicate. This level is narrated by Spider-Man's co-creator, Stan Lee, which is an awesome feature. But this is just the beginning, Spidey fans. So get ready for a true superhero action thriller, packed to the brim with thrills and chills, twists and turns. And you were given some gameplay tutorials from Black Cat, who makes a few appearances, assisting Spider-Man. While swinging across the rooftops, you can also visit the Fantastic Four HQ. Landing on top gets you one of the comic book collectibles in the game, and Spidey says that they're not around right now to help. When you make it to the bank, you'll be given several objectives, such as rescuing hostages, opening certain doors by finding the relative switches, and disposing of a bomb on a timer by locking it inside a refrigerator. There is also more advanced AI than previous Spider-Man adventures, with you able to crawl along the ceilings and silently take out your enemies with your webs before they've spotted you. The gameplay is so addictive and constantly challenges you. Daredevil also makes a cameo appearance as he questions Spider-Man if it really was him that caused the heist. He uses his radar sense to detect whether Peter is lying, and he believes him, promising to spread the word about his innocence. From here it's on to the second chapter where Scorpion has headed to the Daily Bugle to exact his revenge on J. Jonah Jameson for permanently sticking him in the Scorpion suit. Spidey races to the Bugle to rescue Jameson and battles Scorpion, throwing the furniture of the Bugle officers at him. But when the police arrive, they open fire on Spider-Man, causing him to swing away and be chased across the rooftops by helicopters and multiple SWAT units. Once you've cleared the police, Black Cat arrives to tell Spidey that the Omnitech power plant is being attacked by Rhino. But at the same time, Venom broadcasts in Times Square that he has kidnapped Mary Jane. Spider-Man has to make a choice between rescuing the people at Omnitech from the rampaging Rhino or save Mary Jane, and he makes the tough decision to help the others first, as with great power must come great responsibility. In Chapter 3, Black Cat heads to Omnitech first, however she is surprise attacked by Rhino, who hits her in the back with his horn. Spidey battles the Rhino, tricking him into charging into power couplings. Peter tries to find Black Cat after the battle. He sees her being wheeled onto a stretcher into the back of an ambulance, but we see that Doc Ock and Carnage are the ones driving. 
Spider leaves to find his friend Johnny Storm to ask for his help on the situation with Venom, but Venom tracks him down first. He makes Spider-Man chase him into his lair where he can battle him. Venom has powers of intangibility in this game, which is quite interesting. The webhead follows Venom down into the sewers and even on the subway where he has to also deal with the lizard's escaped experiments. In his sewer maze, if you go one of the wrong ways, you can find Lizard, who has been imprisoned by Venom, who is now using Lizard's lair. He helps Spider-Man by giving him directions in the sewers. Spider-Man then makes it to the lair and battles Venom, rescuing Mary Jane before she can drown. Spider-Man tells Venom to remember back to the day of the heist, when Eddie bumped into Peter in the audience. With Venom realising that Spidey is innocent, the two decide to form a temporary alliance, to find out who had staged the heist. In Chapter 5, Venom and Spider-Man plan to infiltrate the Daily Bugle for research, only to find it infested by hostless symbiotes, being created by generators. In this level, there's a magnesium web pickup that makes your web burn the symbiotes, which is our first signs of web upgrades being introduced. Spidey travels all the way down into the basement of the Daily Bugle only to find his imposter who reveals himself to be Mysterio. The master of illusion grows to a humongous size and attacks Spider-Man. Spidey destroys the conduits boosting Mysterio's power until he is defeated and finishes him off by smashing his fishbowl helmet. Mysterio reveals that the fog is preparing the citizens of New York for symbiosis and tells Spider-Man where he can find the base creating the symbiotes. Spidey travels to the waterfront warehouse but is attacked by the Punisher who attempts to shoot him. Spider-Man tells him that he's innocent to which Punisher offers to help him clear the warehouse but Spidey declines the offer not wanting to deal with the bloodshed. Inside the warehouse, he finds a base far underneath the ground. He finds and rescues Black Cat, who had been held prisoner, and he also closes the doors on the pipes, releasing the fog into the city. Once he reaches the main room, he is confronted by the two foes, Dr. Octopus and Carnage. Venom suddenly arrives and battles Carnage, while Spidey has his showdown with Doc Ock. Once Octavius is defeated, Spidey goes to assist Venom, he defeats Carnage by knocking him into a sonic bubble, weakening the symbiote, and causing it to leave Cletus Cassidy. However, it instead attaches to Octavius, turning him into a Monster Ock. Spidey is chased by Monster Ock through the facility. He just makes it once the base explodes and saves Otto. He then climbs aboard the Quinjet, rescued by Captain America. In the epilogue, Spidey takes a load off, playing cards with Daredevil, Cap and the Punisher, whilst Black Cat dances with Johnny Storm. Meanwhile in prison, Dr. Octopus shares a cell with Scorpion, Rhino, Mysterio and a Jade Syndicate thug, and the idiocy of Rhino makes Ock bang his head on the cell bars, a comical end to a fantastic game. While the campaign itself is fairly short, the game comes with so many great extras that your first playthrough is only the beginning. For starters, there is the training mode, which features extra challenges for you to complete, such as a target practice where you shoot cutouts of different Spidey villains with your webs, and there's an item collection challenge and more. There is also a gallery full of character bios, models to view, storyboards to look at, and collectible comic book covers that give brief descriptions on the plot of each comic book that you find. There are also 9 additional alternate costumes to unlock, which are not only cosmetic, but some of them have additional bonuses that change certain gameplay aspects. There's Spider-Man 2099, aka Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man from the future. He has double damage bonus. There's the symbiote costume, which is the same alien parasite that forms Venom. Because it creates webbing from its own body, this costume comes with an unlimited webbing bonus. There's Captain Universe, which is when Spider-Man is gifted the power of the universe from the Enigma Force. This costume grants him double damage, unlimited webbing and invincibility. There's Spider-Man Unlimited from the animated series of the same name, where Spider-Man has a nanotech suit. This costume lets you turn invisible to get past enemies with ease. There's the amazing Bagman, which sees Peter in a Fantastic Four outfit with a bag over his head to conceal his identity. This outfit only lets you carry two web cartridges instead of the usual ten. There's Scarlet Spider-Man, who was a clone of Peter Parker called Ben Riley. He also gets a second take on his Spider-Man costume when Ben took over as the friendly neighbourhood superhero for a short time. 
these two don't have any bonuses. There's Quick Change Spidey when Peter is halfway through changing into his alter ego, and lastly you could play as Peter Parker himself without his Spider-Man costume. If you still want more content, then by typing in the cheat code GBHSRSPM, you'll unlock What If Mode, a homage to the Marvel comic series that sees the stories we know but change with new outcomes. The What If Mode makes some changes to the main game, but nothing that majorly alters the story, mostly just cameos from more Marvel characters. Like Watu the Watcher now narrates the intro instead of Stan Lee. Swinging to the Fantastic Four building, has Johnny Storm tell Spidey that the Fantastic Four can't help as they're busy battling Mole Man. Ghost Rider can also be seen riding his motorcycle down skyscrapers in the second chapter. Spidey finds the Ark of the Covenant in the warehouse at the end of the game. And the Prince of Atlantis, Namor, watches the battle against Carnage. There are also some more little secrets to discover and I'd certainly say it's worth playing through the short game a second time to try and spot everything. The Dreamcast version of the game was handled by Treyarch, recognised today for their Call of Duty Black Ops franchise. This version has some deeper details on the character models, like Spider-Man having the web design on his costume. The Game Boy Color version was almost like an entirely other game. Developed by Vicarious Visions, this is a more classic side-scrolling action game that borrows a few elements from the console versions, such as the plot of Dr. Octopus wanting to create a symbiote army. The game has some neat animations and Spider-Man can web shoot, web swing and create a web shield which was unique for this version. In this version you first battle Venom, who then alerts Spidey of Doc Ock's plans. You then get distracted by Lizard and Hobgoblin, who were hired and paid by Ock to keep Spider-Man occupied. But foiling his plans, you make it to Octavius' base and defeat him. In this version, Doc Ock was holding Carnage captive and using him to create the symbiotes. Carnage escapes his prison and is the next battle. Once the pair are defeated, you face Monster Ock. However, unlike the console version, you battle him one-on-one -on -one with it no longer being a chase sequence. Spider-Man 2000 was unarguably the biggest video game release that the character had seen at the time, with it being one of the PlayStation's best-selling games, and also one of the highest rated Spider-Man video games. And to consider that it was the first Spider-Man game to leap onto 3D, when many other titles were struggling with the new dimensions at the time, it is quite an achievement. GameSpot called it an exceptional game and an excellent framework on which to build future Spider-Man games from whereas IGN called it arguably the best Spider-Man game. This game was also my very first video game that I remember playing on my old grey PlayStation 1, and for that, Spider-Man 2000 holds a very strong place in my heart. After the terrific success with their first Spider-Man outing, Activision got a little ahead of themselves in the year of 2001 releasing three new Spider-Man games that built off from Spider-Man 2000. The first was Spider-Man 2 The Sinister Six, that released exclusively for the Game Boy Color and was developed by Taurus Games. This game was an alternative continuation that followed on from the events of specifically the Game Boy Color version of Spider-Man 2000. It plays mostly similar to the previous entry, just now featuring objectives that must be completed first before you can reach the boss of the stage, such as finding keys. Dr. Octopus is back at large, he is planning a new scheme to defeat Spider-Man and has assembled more sinister foes to assist him. He sends Scorpion and Sandman to kidnap Aunt May, who Doc Ock knows via his old student Peter Parker, who takes pictures of Spider-Man for the Daily Bugle. With Aunt May's life in danger, Spidey is ready to face any threats in order to save her. There are six stages, each one ending in a battle against one of the members of the Sinister Six. At the Coney Island Pier, Spidey battles Mysterio, however he manages to escape. He then defeats Sandman, who tells Spidey about the whereabouts of the Vulture at the World Trade Center. Heading over to the towers, Spidey battles and defeats Vulture, who drops a clue leading the webhead to Madison Square Garden where he battles Scorpion. From here Spidey heads to Central Park where he is ambushed by debuting bad guy Craven the Hunter, who is always after a challenge. 
After the duel, Spidey is victorious, and Craven, out of honour for his opponent, tells Spider-Man where to find Dr. Octopus. He travels to Empire State University and has a final duel with Oc inside. He rescues Aunt May and escorts her safely home. This was another well-received Spider-Man entry, not quite as groundbreaking as the previous one, but still an enjoyable adventure all the same, feeling like it had been ripped from the pages of the comic books. A few months later in 2001, released the second sequel, Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, exclusively for the PlayStation, and was developed by Vicarious Visions. This game is a continuation of the home console version of Spider-Man 2000, taking place directly after it. It plays just like its predecessor, having the same web swinging mechanic, wall crawling features, same enemy AI, spider armor pickup, and web based abilities with only slight improvements. Spidey himself even came with new webs under his arms. The biggest evolution however was the introduction of some street based levels that have you completing multiple objectives on the ground such as disarming bombs, preventing a plane from crashing, or switching the right order of breakers at a train yard. In Enter Electro, it begins with Max Dillon entering a facility and frying the workers inside, to steal a machine called the Bionexus device that when completed and worn, can amplify his electricity based powers making him like a god. Electro has hired a number of villains to assist him in achieving his goal. When Spider-Man, still voiced by Reno Romano, hears of the break-in, he sets out to track down any possible leads. The first level begins with narration from Stan Lee once again. Replacing Black Cat for the tutorial is Hank McCoy, or also known as Beast, one of the members of the X-Men. The X-Men play a significant role in this game, with Professor X and Rogue also making an appearance in the new training mode, testing Spider-Man's skills in the X-Men Mansion's advanced training space called the Danger Room. His first lead in his investigation is Herman Schultz, aka The Shocker. Schultz used his time in prison to develop Vibro Shock Wave Gauntlets and a vibrational bodysuit that he used to escape and continue his criminal career. He is defeated and Spider-Man uses him to get information on his next lead. Back to the investigation, Spider-Man chases someone in a trench coat across the train yard, but he is stopped by Sandman who begins putting up walls preventing him from reaching the train. Spider-Man manages to get past Sandman and on board he almost captures the Beetle, but the high-tech villain is surprisingly not fought and instead he escapes. The next battle is against the Mafia families, who have been paid by Electro to take down Spider-Man, and they are led by Hammerhead, a dangerous criminal who had a plate surgically implanted in his forehead made of the same adamantium metal that Wolverine's claws are made from. He uses it to charge at Spider-Man, and is also equipped with a 1920 gangster's favourite firearm, the Tommy Gun. Still, Hammerhead is no match for the wall crawler, and he is quickly silenced. From here, Spidey heads to his old friend Dr. Kirk Connors for advice, but like any time Peter needs the doc's help, he has smashed up his laboratory after turning back into his feral reptilian form. Spidey uses antidotes to turn Connors back, and he helps Spider-Man find the location of Electro. However, before he can get there, Spider-Man is ambushed by Sandman for a second time defeating him by using the water pipes, turning him into mud. From here he makes it to the museum where Electro is planning his rise to power. The final level was going to take place on top of the World Trade Center, however after the September 11 attacks, it was changed to an unnamed skyscraper instead. You battle Electro inside the tower, and then have a duel on the roof where Electro has become Hyper Electro, a being of pure energy. Spider-Man's suit also becomes battle damaged in this fight, which is really cool. You defeat him by using the dynamos to stun him. When Electro is defeated, he, Hammerhead and Shocker end up in a cell next to the previous game's villains, which is a nice another funny ending to the game. Enter Electro is roughly the same length as the previous entry, but also comes with a ton of extra content afterwards. You have the new Danger Room training mode, led by Professor X and Rogue, that will teach you and challenge you with all the game's mechanics. There's also the return of the gallery, that features character bios and more comic books to find and collect. For alternate costumes, Enter Electro includes all the ones that were available in the previous game, complete with their bonuses. 
and also comes with eight new ones. There's Spider Phoenix, which Spider-Man wore when the Phoenix Force merged with him. This suit gives you invincibility and enhanced strength and web swinging. Prodigy is one of a few alter egos that Peter took up when he was pursued by the law and continued his crime fighting. This suit gives you a double jump and enhanced strength and web swinging. Dusk is another one of these alter egos, this one being completely black and allows you to turn invisible much like the Spider-Man Unlimited costume. There's the insulated suit, a rubber suit that doesn't conduct electricity and deals double damage, perfect against Electro. There's the Alex Ross costume that grants double jump, this being a concept costume for the upcoming Spider-Man movie. And there's a second concept costume but in white, this one having enhanced web swinging. There's Venom 2 Earth X, another symbiote costume which grants you unlimited webbing and enhanced strength. And there's the negative zone costume, worn in a dimension that turns colours negative. There is also a new Create a Spider feature, allowing you to take any of the costumes and apply your own bonuses to them. The What If mode also returns in this sequel, however it doesn't have as many changes as the first game, mostly consisting of developers trying to cram as many banana jokes as they can into the game. Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro is often regarded as one of the more underrated Spider-Man video games, due to its lower reception than the previous game when it launched. Critics at the time commented on the game's short runtime, more obscure choice of villains, and lack of originality. One score from IGN even dropping as low as a 5 out of 10. But in hindsight, Enter Electro is a solid follow-up. To say that it only had one year of development, and delays from the September 11 attacks, the cast of villains definitely feels like a breath of fresh air after so many games that had Dr Octopus or the symbiotes as the main antagonist. Enter Electro has had a little bit of a resurgence of interest in recent years from various YouTube channels, and it's nice to see that this once forgotten about Spidey game gets some of the love that it deserves. The final 2001 Spider-Man game released in fall of that year, and was titled Spider-Man Mysterio's Menace, releasing exclusively for the Game Boy Advance, and was the third game in the series developed by Vicarious Visions. This game takes place a short while after Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, and was another 2D side-scrolling adventure that very much plays like the previous ones, and features some elements from the 3D entries, such as different suits that give you additional bonuses web upgrades and cartridge upgrades to unlock and level objectives such as rescuing hostages or finding certain objects in order to progress. In Mysterio's Menace, the game starts with Peter Parker on the phone to his wife Mary Jane who is asking for him to pick up a fishbowl whilst he's out, ironically. Meanwhile, Peter sees reports of violence all over New York City and it would seem some of his old foes have once again escaped their cells. There are seven levels in total, with a level select feature allowing you to choose which emergencies that you see to first, starting with three levels to choose from that unlock more as you continue playing. Two levels have you take down the gangster Hammerhead for a second time who is causing a killing spree. Another level has you battle a very obscure Marvel villain, Big Wheel, who very much is just that, a guy in a giant wheel machine. <laughs> Spidey jokes that you can't remember who this guy is and also references Sinister Six and Hydra, which I like to think is a nice nod to Spider-Man Web of Fire. The next villains you battle are Electro, Rhino and Scorpion, all returning with their same looks and designs from the previous games. That leaves just one more, the menacing Mysterio. He had hired the villains to guard the technology required to create holographic projections across New York City. Spider-Man finds where Mysterio is hiding at an abandoned amusement park and battles him once again. After a lengthy duel, Mysterio is defeated, however he manages to escape, leaving Spidey with only his suit and glass helmet. Peter decides to take the helmet home to Mary Jane to use as the fishbowl that she wanted at the beginning. <laughs> New York is saved once more. And that brings us to the end of this first chapter of Spider-Man video games. Peter Parker has battled many colourful foes and has been assisted by a whole myriad of other Marvel heroes. There's been some great adventures 
and even some not-so-perfect ones, but the legend of the fabled young hero that encourages us to hold on a second longer lives on. So, nice of you to join us for once, Spidey. Oh, I'm sorry. I was out saving the world. 